Wow. Thank you. And thank you for singing with such passion, with such heart. It's a joy to worship our God when people assemble and love to worship our God. And I trust that he will be pleased with our sacrifice of praise. It has been so good to be with you this weekend. I have enjoyed it. It's gone by fast. It's been busy. Uh, but I've enjoyed being with you and meeting new people, seeing folks I already know and love and being reacquainted. And so I will leave here and go home with many friends here in Lubbock. And I just appreciate all of you very much. Appreciate this church for what you are and the spirit that you bring to the worship assembly and the good work that you do and the reputation that you have. I must ask this question. <clears throat> Who is assigned to lock up this building and turn out the lights? Anybody want to volunteer? Nobody? That's the whole point. You people don't go home. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't do any good to just tell somebody to lock it. Poor, poor guy would be here all night, you know? So... Thank you all for that, uh, that great example. You can tell when people love each other and enjoy being together when the assembly is over and nobody really goes anywhere. Everybody sticks around and stands around and talks and visits and just uh, enjoys being together. And I tell you, that's one of the great things when we bring people to services and invite them to come with us. I'm going to tell you, they're going to notice that too. And if there's anything that our world needs, it's to see the example of people who genuinely care for one another and love one another. And by your worship example and by your friendliness example, I tell you, it is a great evangelistic tool that sometimes we forget the impression that we can make upon those around us. So I thank you for doing all of that and I thank you for encouraging me this weekend so very, very much. It's good to be with the Fritzes again on American soil and to see them and get to uh, visit a little bit. I've enjoyed that and look up to them and appreciate their work so very, very much. And the rest of you, I just can't thank you enough for the work that you do. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 31. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 31. I want to look with you at the challenge of Jesus in these verses. Matthew 6, 31. When he says, stop worrying. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now Jesus said you can spend all of your time worrying about this and worrying about that and chasing after all of the minor things of life, all of the minutia of life, but he says people who don't even believe in God do that. You see that in verse 32? For the Gentiles, the unbelievers, he says, they want these things, they seek after these things. And so the challenge is in verse 33. He says, get your priorities straight. Seek first his kingdom, that is, his right of rule in your life. And seek his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Get your priorities straight. Let me ask you a question. Very personal question. When you think about the way that you pray, maybe go back over the last year or so, when you think about the way you pray, do you pray big? Or do you pray small? Do you pray more in keeping with verse 31? What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Or do you pray more in keeping with verse 33? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Which is it? 
Now, don't misunderstand and don't take what I'm saying and run off down the road with it. Because I'm not saying God doesn't care about the basic essentials of life. I'm not saying God doesn't care about food and clothing and shelter. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that sometimes the focus of our prayer life is all about food and clothing and shelter. Or we pray about, Lord, help me get through this allergy season. Or, Lord, help me pass the test at school. Or help me get through school. Help me get a paycheck on Friday. Help me find my car keys. Help me have sweet dreams. And on and on and on we go. Is that the way we pray? I wonder sometimes if our God does not look at His people and say, do you really want to spend an entire another year coming to me with the same small requests? Don't we sing about this God that moves mountains? Don't we sing how great thou art? That our God is an awesome God? And then we pray. Small. Lord, help me get through this cold. That's it. And God said, isn't there something bigger you need me to do? So what are you praying for big? When you think about the way you pray, is your prayers mostly concerning little things? Or do you pray in a way that takes your faith and stretches it as far as it will go? Which is it? Are our prayers rote? That is, we just simply are repetitive in the words and the words really don't mean a lot to us? Or does something grip your heart so much that when you talk about it, when you pray about it, you get emotional about it? And you pray in essence and say, God, if you don't, it won't. It may be God's healing hand upon a loved one who is sick. It may be the need that you have for a marriage that is crumbling. It may need, may need to be the, the prayer for the gospel to sink into the heart of a dear friend or a loved one. What are you praying for that is bigger than you can work out on your own? What are you praying for that gets beyond your ability, beyond your capability, beyond your know-how, beyond your vision? What are you praying for that stretches your faith to its capacity? If your prayer requests equate to the size of your God, how big is your God? Now don't misunderstand. This is not about approaching God like he's some kind of Santa Claus. Oh, pray big. Well, dear God, I want a million dollars. That's big. I want a new car. I want to go to Disney. If you think that's what I'm talking about, you've been listening to way too much Joel Osteen. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something inside of you that is intimidating to you, and it is so intimidating to you that you're afraid to ask. You're afraid to talk to God about it. Because to talk to God about that would take you outside your comfort zone and would literally put your faith to the test. Put your faith to the test. And that's what I mean when I talk about praying big. So take your Bibles and go with me to the 11th chapter of Luke. To Luke chapter 11 and verse 1 where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray big. In Luke 11 and verse 1, the scripture says, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. Now, I must tell you that when I read that verse and think about it a little while, it seems rather odd to me. It seems odd to me because these were good, young Jewish men. And these young Jewish men have been raised in the synagogue. And these young Jewish men raised in the synagogue have heard men, older men, praying 
many, many times, and no doubt they have been taught to pray since they were young. And now in the company of Jesus, they start watching Jesus pray, and they begin to see that Jesus prays different than we pray. It's like, well, we pray, and he prays. And so they come to Jesus, and they say, we want to we pray like you pray. Help us to be able to do that. Teach us to pray. Well, he does. Verse 2, he said to them, when you pray, say... Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And where's the rest of it? Where's the rest of it? Oh, Jesus didn't say it right. He, let off, he left off a bunch of stuff. And so normally if we're teaching the Luke chapter 11, we're going to stop right there and say, well, we've got to go back to Matthew chapter 6 and get the full version of the Lord's Prayer, we say. Well, first of all, it's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. It's the disciples who came to Jesus and asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. It's the disciples' prayer. And secondly, it's not the Lord's Prayer in the sense that it's not even repeated word for word in Luke's account. But then again, prayer, the point of prayer is not memorization. It's not wrote. It's not word for word. Sometimes we teach our children word for word. You remember this one? Now I lay me down to I pray the Lord my soul to, if I should die before I, I pray the Lord my soul to, great, you just put your kid to bed and told him he's probably not going to live through the night. <laughs> really? God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. And so we memorize just words. You know, we tried to teach our kids when they were growing up. We tried to teach them, pray from the heart. Just pray from the heart. Don't listen to what somebody else says. You pray from the heart. Now, sometimes that will come back and bite you. Our son Dale was about 15 years old. And he, he had the closing prayer on a Sunday night. And we had a young man preach that particular Sunday night who had... He was a young man. It was his first time to ever preach. And, we, and so the elders gave him that opportunity. And, and so he brought the lesson that Sunday night. And our son Dale had the closing prayer. And I kid you not, our son Dale leads the closing prayer with these words. God, we know that Brother Jason isn't a real preacher. <laughs> but he did the best he could do. Do you ever have one of those parent moments <laughs> when you wanted to hug your kid and kill them all at the same time, you know? But he's just doing what we taught him to do. <laughs> Listen, Jesus says prayer comes down to this, the basics of prayer, 101, here it is. Thank God for your blessings, confess the greatness of God, confess your dependence upon him, and these verses... Two and three and four. These are kind of the ABCs of prayer. But that's not what they're asking. When they're saying, Lord, teach us to pray, they're wanting more than that. And so Jesus gives them more than that. Verse 5. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend... Lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. So Jesus tells a story. And he sets the scene, and he says, It's midnight, and suddenly there's this banging on the door, and this audacious request for help. Now please understand that back then, not like in our day, Back then it was one big room in the house in which everybody slept. 
And so it's not like this man can get up in the middle of the night, go out into the kitchen and get something out of the fridge or the cupboard and hand it to his neighbor without disturbing everybody else. Because back then when it was bedtime, it was all in. And so it's midnight and everybody's in bed and everybody's asleep and he hears this, get up, I need bread. I've got company, you've got to get up and help me. But what response does he get? Verse 7. And from inside he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. You know the Greek literally is that my children are in bed with me. (laughs) I cannot get up and give you anything. Translate. What are you trying to do? Wake up the whole house? If I get up and give you bread, then it's going to wake up everybody in the house. Go away. Now, the disciples had heard enough stories of Jesus to know that when Jesus usually told a story, a couple of things occurred. Someone in the story usually would represent us And someone in the story would usually represent God. And so as Jesus is telling the story, you can see the wheels turning in the minds of the disciples. Wait a minute. In the story, the person that's coming and banging on the door and asking for help, that's got to be us. But in the story, the man who is asleep and doesn't want to be bothered and says, go away, Is that God? So I want you to be really honest. Haven't you sometimes felt that way about God? That maybe if you prayed about something too big or too often, you might be bothering Him? Or if you had something on your heart and you prayed and prayed and prayed about it, and nothing ever happened that you just decided, well, God doesn't care. God is asleep to my needs. I think sometimes we think that about God. Well, let, let's read a little further. Verse 8. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. The only reason given for the man to receive his request was because the neighbor had the audacity to ask for it in the first place. The Greek word is persistence, boldness, shamelessness, shameless, bold persistence. This guy's not going away. It's like he just keeps knocking. I know you're in there. I know you're in there. I know you're in there. And ladies and gentlemen, the whole scene that Jesus is painting is inappropriate. And so in the story, the man gets up out of bed, no doubt wakes everybody up, stumbles through the dark, finds some bread, and hands it to his neighbor here. And the disciples are kind of scratching their heads. You mean God is like that? And Jesus, in essence, is saying... You're the ones who came to me. You're the ones who came to me to ask me about prayer. I'm telling you about prayer. We'll come back to this in just a minute, but if you flip over a few more chapters to Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 through 7, he tells another story about prayer. And in this story about prayer, he tells about a widow who keeps coming before this judge And she keeps showing up and she keeps asking and asking and asking and pleading and pleading and pleading. And finally, the judge gives her what she wants because the judge figures out if I don't, she's not going to go away. And the whole point of that story, again, is about prayer. Verse 1, how at all times we should pray and not grow weary. So if you take both of these stories and put them together, In the first story, just kind of looking at it on the surface, Jesus presents God as the one who is asleep and he doesn't like to be bothered. And in the second story, 
here's this judge harassed by a widow to the point that, well, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And we look at these and what is he trying to teach us about God? And this is where we make a big mistake with the stories of Jesus. We want the stories of Jesus to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle where all the pieces just fit perfectly the way we think they ought to fit. And that's not the purpose of the parables. Not at all. When Jesus is telling these stories... His focus is not on God. The, the, the stories are not about God. The whole focus of both of these stories is not on God. It's on us. We are the focal point of the story because it's the disciples who came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so us, we are the focal point of the stories, not God. But as you read in Luke 11, this is not how we usually teach a class on prayer. When we teach about prayer, we tend to teach polite prayer. We tend to teach tame prayer. We get in a Bible class and we say, okay, boys and girls, let's fold our hands and bow our heads and let's all pray. And that's how we usually think about prayer. But it is interesting to me, when Jesus talks about prayer, he launches into stories about begging and pleading and asking and interrupting. And he goes on, he says in verse 9, I say unto you, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. Three words describe this persistence, ask and seek and knock but it is not one and done. The force of the words is you ask and you keep on asking. You seek and you keep on seeking. You knock and you keep on knocking. And you don't quit. When I was a teenager, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. And the congregation that we were a part of had a, had a very large teenage class. We were about 30, I think. And so we were going to have a gospel meeting, I think. And so the elder said, let's get the young people involved. And let's have the young people come to the building on Saturday and get meeting flyers. And we'll map out the area and send our teenagers out to kind of canvas the area and pass out flyers and invite them, everybody to the meeting. So we all showed up on a Saturday morning. And uh, my buddy Jeff and I uh, kind of paired, everybody paired up. And so we had our signed our sign streets, and so I got my flyers, and Jeff got his flyers, and we, 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 we drove off, went to the, where we were supposed to be. And I got out of the car, and I took my flyers, and I walked up to the first house. But I got to tell you, my heart wasn't in this. I really wasn't into this. And I was so afraid, what would I do if I knock on the door and somebody answers? I won't know what to say. And so I devised a strategy as I approached the first door. I walked up to that door and I knocked this way. Oh, nobody home. And I took that flyer and I rolled it up and I stuck it in the screen door. And I went to the next house and I, oh, nobody home. And I, I rolled up. I didn't knock loud enough to wake up anybody's dog. And I passed out all of my flyers, and I never had to talk to anybody, you know. And I wonder sometimes, as, as adults, I wonder sometimes if that's how we pray. Lord, and that's it. I challenge you to study the scriptures and the prayers of these people. Read the prayers of the Bible. When these people prayed, they came after God. You read the prayers of Abraham and Moses and Hannah. Remember the prayer of Hagar. Remember the prayer of Mary and David and Esther and I. The prayers of Isaiah and Job and Paul. When these people prayed, they prayed and they prayed big and they prayed bold. 
And they prayed to God and they said, God, you cannot ignore me. God, you have to respond. God, you have promised your people. And what I learned from Scripture as I study the prayers is that God honors persistence and God honors boldness because it's as if, as, as if God is saying, finally somebody is asking me to do something worthy of who I am. These people did not stop praying because God didn't just immediately give them an answer. They didn't stop praying because God didn't just immediately give them justice. They didn't stop praying because God didn't just immediately give them what they wanted. They kept praying and they kept praying. And the point of Scripture is that kind of praying doesn't annoy him at all. In fact, he is honored by that. That's the kind of prayer that he likes to answer. Verse 10. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. You know, he's not saying, pray about it on Sunday and it's going to be in your mailbox on Monday. That's not what he's saying. <coughs> what he is saying is, you may have to pray about it for a month of Sundays. You may have to pray about it for a year of Sundays. But you, you ask and you keep on asking and you seek and you keep on seeking and you knock and you keep on knocking. Why? Because everyone who asks and seeks and knocks and asks and seeks and knocks and asks and seeks and knocks receives. They find. The door is opened. Now then, usually when we study Luke chapter 11 and we teach on prayer, we'll stop here and we'll spend time, kind of time out, and we'll we'll talk about, well, we all understand that prayer involves the will of God and that our requests are subservient to his will. And so we'll go to passages like Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39 where Jesus is in the garden praying, thy will be done. Or James chapter 4 and verse 15, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about that and making sure everybody understands that. I think you already understand that. I think you already get that. And it is interesting to me, in Luke 11, Jesus doesn't, he doesn't even go there. So I'm going to stay with the text of Luke 11 and come right back to the point. Do you pray politely or do you pray boldly? Do you pray little or do you pray big? No wonder so little happens in our lives. Because as James says, you do not have because you do not ask. And Jesus would add to that and ask and ask and ask. No wonder so little happens in churches for the same reason. You do not have because you do not ask and ask and ask and ask. You know, when I was a little boy, when I, when I was growing up, in the height of the Cold War, and by the way, You know, my kids come home, and, or I've had my kids come home and complain. We had a fire drill today. You know, blah, blah, blah. Big deal. We had atomic bomb drills. I mean, we would climb under uh, the, the atomic bomb drill. You had to climb under your wooden desk and put your hands over your head in a certain way and hide. Do you know why Russia never attacked the United States? Because every school child in America was under that wooden desk and that wooden desk would protect against anything. <laughs> but I grew up going to church and I would hear older men pray. And time after time, week after week, I would hear older men pray, Lord, tear down the iron curtain so that the gospel could have free course in that part of the world where it cannot go today. And the next Sunday you'd hear the same thing and it would be said over and over and over again. Do you think the Iron Curtain fell because President Reagan said to President Gorbachev, tear down this wall? Oh, God may have used those as principles in his plan 
But I tend to think something bigger was going on. I think God answered those prayers. And today there's brethren meeting in, in those places. In Moldova, and Romania, in Bulgaria, and in Ukraine. I saw pictures today of brethren in Ukraine meeting for the last time. And it just rips your heart out. God moves when his people pray. He may not move on our timetable. And he has plans about which you and I have no concept. And we sing the song in his time, in his time. And we have to trust his timing. But I'll give you an even bigger example than that. Some of you are here today. Because you had a mom, because you had a dad, because you had a sister, because you had a friend, because you had a spouse, and they kept asking and asking and asking. And at the time of their asking, you were off somewhere else. You were seeing the lights of the far city, you weren't interested in spiritual things, you, you just didn't care. And if anybody tried to talk to you about God and the Bible and all that, it'd make you mad. But in the meantime, somebody kept praying and praying and praying and praying for you. And then something happened. Something got your attention. You had a prodigal moment. You came home. And some of you have been on the giving end of those kind of prayers. Some of you have been on the receiving end of those kind of prayers. But whether end you're on, you understand the point that is made. God honors bold, persistent, I'm not going to stop praying about this prayer. It's as if God says, now that I see you're passionate about this, now we'll do something about this. Lord, teach us to pray. Folks, we've got to get out of our comfort zone. Are you willing to knock on heaven's door? And knock and knock and knock and knock? Somebody says, well, what if God doesn't answer? Well, what does Jesus say? Knock one time and go away? Well, you don't know the size of my burden. Well, I, I probably don't. But apparently you don't know the size of your God. I think of the ten spies. They came back and said, we can't invade the land. We can't take the land. You wouldn't believe the size of the giants. And what did Joshua and Caleb say? Get your eyes off the giants and get your eyes on God. There's always going to be giants in the land. There's always going to be Goliaths in our path. There's always going to be Jericho walls that we're up against that we can't go over, can't go under, can't go around. Always. I think about Joshua and those Israelite soldiers. And they, he had them... They were marching around those walls and they kept marching and marching and they, they, they marched one time around every day and nothing happened. And then they marched the seventh time around and nothing happened and the eighth time around and nothing happened and the ninth time they went around and the tenth time and the eleventh time nothing happened and they marched around the twelfth time and nothing happened and they marched around the thirteenth time and the walls fell down flat. And I wonder how many of us would have just given up after the, first, after the fifth or sixth or seventh time and just said, fooey on this. God had them marching around 13 times to test their faith. And the walls fell down flat. Haven't we learned anything from this book? We honor God by the way we pray. He loves it when his people have a big faith and aren't afraid to pray big prayers. We sing all about his greatness. We open our Bibles and we read all about his greatness. And then sometimes we pray very small. The early church 
pray jail doors off their hinges and they prayed an empire off its foundation. God moves when his people pray. I close in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and verse 21. Where the Apostle Paul ends this mountain top scripture with these words. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. There's a lot to pray for. A lot to pray for. So let's take a moment and pray. Our Father, we're thankful for the day. We're thankful for the occasion we can open up your word and be challenged by it. We pray, Father, that we won't just see words on a page, but Father, we pray that you will put these words in our hearts. We pray that you will teach us to pray. Father, we pray that you will teach us to have faith, even when we don't understand. Father, Father, we pray for the world condition as it is. And we pray, Father, we pray and ask that you would put a stop and an end to this senseless violence that is in Eastern Europe. Father, we pray that you will intercede for these people who are vulnerable and innocent. We see pictures of old people. We see pictures of children. Father, these are innocent people. And then we see pictures of our own brethren, your children. And Father, we ask, we ask that you would put a stop to this. And Father, we pray that you would use any of us through any contacts we may have to help and to provide strength and encouragement for these people who have been displaced. We pray for our brethren in Ukraine. We also pray for our brethren in Russia because, Father, they too are caught in the middle through no choosing of their own. And we pray for them and we pray that you would comfort them as well. We pray for our leaders. We pray, Father, for the leaders of the world countries and we pray that World War III will not commence and bring harm to all of us. But we pray, Father, that our leaders will be be people of wisdom and that they'll use some wisdom so that we may lead a tranquil and peaceful and quiet life and so that the gospel can continue to be spread. We pray, Father, for the church here at Milwaukee Avenue. We pray that you will be with this congregation and help them to continue to grow and spread your word like wildfire. Be with these young people and the people that you put in their paths, whether it be on a university campus or through work or through friends, whatever it may be, help them to shine their light and spread their salt. Help the older people to understand how much they are appreciated and how much they are loved. And we pray, Father, that you will bless this church with growth. It's been a very difficult couple of years for your your people everywhere. And we pray, Father, that we can shake off the shackles of apathy and that we can serve you with all of our heart with everything we have. Bless the homes here. Bless the marriages here. And help us to help each other. And Father, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteous living. Keep us in your care. May we walk by faith and not by sight. And may your greatest and richest blessings be with those who seek to spread your word and bring those people to you. And we thank you for Jesus who makes it all possible. In his name we pray. Amen.
we sing the song of invitation. If you're not a child of God, why don't you become one? Give your life to Jesus Christ. Be buried in baptism for the remission of your sins. And walk in newness of life. There's no life like the newness of life. Won't you come while we stand and sing?